Ethnomethodology, Wikipedia Audio Ethnomethodology is the study of methods people use for understanding and producing the social order in which they live. It generally seeks to provide an alternative to mainstream sociological approaches. In its most radical form, it poses a challenge to the social sciences as a whole. On the other hand, its early investigations led to the founding of conversation analysis, which has found its own place as an accepted discipline within the academy. According to Sathas, it is possible to distinguish five major approaches within the ethno-methodological family of disciplines. Ethnomethodology provides methods which have been used in ethnographic studies to produce accounts of people's methods for negotiating everyday situations. It is a fundamentally descriptive discipline which does not engage in the explanation or evaluation of the particular social order undertaken as a topic of study. However, applications have been found within many applied disciplines such as software design and management studies. The term's meaning can be broken down into its three constituent parts, ethno-methodology, for the purpose of explanation. Using an appropriate Southern California example, ethno refers to a particular socio-cultural group, method refers to the methods and practices this particular group employs in its everyday activities, Anology refers to the systematic description of these methods and practices. The focus of the investigation used in our example is the social order of surfing. The ethno-methodological interest is in the how of the production and maintenance of this social order. In essence ethno-methodology attempts to create classifications of the social actions of individuals within groups through drawing on the experience of the groups directly without imposing on the setting the opinions of the researcher with regards to social order, as is the case with sociological studies. Definition The approach was originally developed by Harold Garfinkel, who attributed its origin to his work investigating the conduct of jury members in 1954. His interest was in describing the common-sense methods through which members of a jury produce themselves in a jury room as a jury. Thus, their methods for establishing matters of fact, developing evidence chains, determining the reliability of witness testimony, establishing the organization of speakers in the jury room itself, and determining the guilt or innocence of defendants, etc. are all topics of interest. Such methods serve to constitute the social order of being a juror for the members of the jury, as well as for researchers and other interested parties, in that specific social setting. This interest developed out of Garfinkel's critique of Talcott Parsons' attempt to derive a general theory of society. This critique originated in his reading of Alfred Schutz, though Garfinkel ultimately revised many of Schutz's ideas. Garfinkel also drew on his study of the principles and practices of financial accounting, the classic sociological theory and methods of Durkheim and Weber, and the traditional sociological concern with the Hobbesian problem of order. For the ethnomethodologist, Participants produce the order of social settings through their shared sense-making practices. Thus, there is an essential natural reflexity between the activity of making sense of a social setting and the ongoing production of that setting, the two are in effect identical. Furthermore, these practices are witnessably enacted, making them available for study. This opens up a broad and multifaceted area of inquiry. John Heritage writes, in its open-ended reference to any kind of sense-making procedure, the term represents a signpost to a domain of uncharted dimensions rather than a staking out of a clearly delineated territory. Ethnomethodology has perplexed commentators, due to its radical approach to questions of theory and method. 
With regard to theory, Garfinkel has consistently advocated an attitude of ethno-methodological indifference, a principled agnosticism with regard to social theory which insists that the shared understandings of members of a social setting under study take precedence over any concepts which a social theorist might bring to the analysis from outside that setting. This can be perplexing to traditional social scientists, trained in the need for social theory and a multiplicity of theoretical references by Anne Rawls, in her introduction to Ethnomthodology's program might be interpreted to suggest a softening of this position towards the end of Garfinkel's life. However, the position is consistent with Ethnomthodology's understanding of the significance of members' methods, and with certain lines of philosophical thought regarding the philosophy of science, and the study of the actual practices of scientific procedure. It also has a strong correspondence with the later philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein, especially as applied to social studies by Peter Winch. Are also made in Garfinkel's work to Husserl, Gerwich, and, most frequently, of course, to the works of the social phenomenologist Alfred Schütz, among others. On the other hand, the authors and theoretical references cited by Garfinkel do not constitute a rigorous theoretical basis for ethnomethodology. Ethnomethodology is not Durkheimian, although it shares some of the interests of Durkheim, it is not phenomenology, although it borrows from Husserl and Schutz's studies of the life world, it is not a form of Gestalt theory although it describes social orders as having gestalt-like properties, and, it is not Wittgensteinian, although it makes use of Wittgenstein's understanding of rule use, etc. Instead, these borrowings are only fragmentary references to theoretical works from which ethnomethodology has appropriated theoretical ideas for the expressed purposes of doing ethnomethodological investigations. Similarly, ethnomethodology advocates no formal methods of inquiry, insisting that the research method be dictated by the nature of the phenomenon that is being studied. Ethnomethodologists have conducted their studies in a variety of ways, and the point of these investigations is to discover the things that persons in particular situations do, the methods they use to create the patterned orderliness of social life. Michael Lynch has noted that, leading figures in the field have repeatedly emphasized that there is no obligatory set of methods, and no prohibition against using any research procedure whatsoever, if it is adequate to the particular phenomena under study. Since ethnomethodology has become anathema to certain sociologists, and since those practicing it like to perceive their own efforts as constituting a radical break from prior sociologies, there has been little attempt to link ethnomethodology to these prior sociologies. However, whilst ethnomethodology is distinct from sociological methods, it does not seek to compete with it, or provide remedies for any of its practices. The ethnomethodological approach differs as much from the sociological approach as sociology does from psychology even though both speak of social action. This does not mean that ethnomethodology does not use traditional sociological forms as a sounding board for its own programmatic development, or to establish benchmarks for the differences between traditional sociological forms of study and ethnomethodology as it only means that ethnomethodology was not established in order to repair, criticize, undermine, or poke fun at traditional sociological forms. In essence the distinctive difference between sociological approaches and ethnomethodology is that the latter adopts a common-sense attitude towards knowledge. In contrast to traditional sociological forms of inquiry, it is a hallmark of the ethnomethodological perspective that it does not make theoretical or methodological appeals to, 
outside assumptions regarding the structure of an actor or actor's characterization of social reality, refer to the subjective states of an individual or groups of individuals, attribute conceptual projections such as, value states, sentiments, goal orientations, mini-max economic theories of behavior, etc., to any actor or group of actors, or posit a specific normative order as a transcendental feature of social scenes, etc. For the ethnomethodologist, the methodic realization of social scenes takes place within the actual setting under scrutiny, and is structured by the participants in that setting through the reflexive accounting of that setting's features. The job of the ethnomethodologist is to describe the methodic character of these activities, not account for them in a way that transcends that which is made available in and through the actual accounting practices of the individual's party to those settings. Origin and Scope The differences can therefore be summed up as follows. Even though ethnomethodology has been characterized as having a phenomenological sensibility, and reliable commentators have acknowledged that there is a strong influence of phenomenology on ethnomethodology, orthodox adherence to the discipline those who follow the teachings of Garfinkel do not represent it as a branch or form of phenomenology or phenomenological sociology. The confusion between the two disciplines stems, in part, from the practices of some ethnomethodologists, who sift through phenomenological texts, recovering phenomenological concepts and findings relevant to their interests, and then transpose these concepts and findings to topics in the study of social order. Such interpretive transpositions do not make the ethnomethodologist a phenomenologist or ethnomethodology a form of phenomenology. To further muddy the waters, some phenomenological sociologists seize upon ethnomethodological findings as examples of applied phenomenology, this even when the results of these ethnomethodological investigations clearly do not make use of phenomenological methods, or formulate their findings in the language of phenomenology. So-called phenomenological analyses of social structures that do not have prima facie reference to any of the structures of intentional consciousness should raise questions as to the phenomenological status of such analyses. Garfinkel speaks of phenomenological texts and findings as being appropriated and intentionally misread for the purposes of exploring topics in the study of social order. These appropriations and methodical misread of phenomenological texts and findings are clearly made for the purposes of furthering ethno-methodological analyses, and should not be mistaken for logical extensions of these phenomenological texts and findings. Lastly, there is no claim in any of Garfinkel's work that ethno-methodology is a form of phenomenology, or phenomenological sociology. To state that ethnomethodology has a phenomenological sensibility or that there is a strong influence of phenomenology on ethnomethodology is not the equivalent of describing ethnomethodology as a form of phenomenology. Even though ethnomethodology is not a form of phenomenology, the reading and understanding of phenomenological texts and developing the capability of seeing phenomenologically is essential to the actual doing of ethno-methodological studies. As Garfinkel states in regard to the work of the phenomenologist Aaron Gerwich, especially his field of consciousness, you can't do anything unless you do read his texts. Theory and Methods Some Leading Policies, Methods, and Definitions According to George Sathas, five types of ethno-methodological study can be identified. These may be characterized as Differences with sociology Links with phenomenology Varieties 
Relationship with Conversational Analysis Further discussion of the varieties and diversity of ethno-methodological investigations can be found in Maynard and Clayman. The relationship between ethno-methodology and conversation analysis has been contentious at times, given their overlapping interests, the close collaboration between their founders and the subsequent divergence of interest among many practitioners. Inasmuch as the study of social orders is inexorably intertwined with the constitutive features of talk about those social orders, Ethnomethodology is committed to an interest in both conversational talk, and the role this talk plays in the constitution of that order. Talk is seen as indexical and embedded in a specific social order. It is also naturally reflexive to and constitutive of that order. Anne Rawls pointed out, many, in fact most, of those who have developed a serious interest in ethnomethodology have also used conversational analysis, developed by Sachs, Skigloff, and Jefferson, as one of their research tools. 143. On the other hand, where the study of conversational talk is divorced from its situated context that is, when it takes on the character of a purely technical method and formal analytic enterprise in its own right it is not a form of ethnomethodology. The danger of misunderstanding here, as Rawls notes, is that conversational analysis can become just another formal analytic enterprise, like any other formal method which brings an analytical toolbox of preconceptions, formal definitions, and operational procedures to the situation slash setting under study. When such analytical concepts are generated from within one setting and conceptually applied to another, the application represents a violation of the strong form of the unique adequacy requirement of methods. Notes Bibliography